Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning in some parts of the world. And kind of like the manner that our CEO from Global Chamber, Doug Brunke, would start off today. Uh, Doug's going to be joining us, hopefully. He's facing some technical issues. But I'm very delighted to welcome you as the Executive Director of Global Chamber Barishal and from Bangladesh to this last episode of the series of the COVID-19 series, actually, of Let's Disrupt. What has Let's Disrupt talked about the last three weeks? We've initiated Globinars to spark conversations on contemporary issues shaping our world so that we can initiate policy recommendations and interventions. We've been supported by Momentum Consultancy and Facilitation Group, and of course, by the amazing research facility, the United Nations Development Program in Bangladesh. So today, after talking about SMEs in the broader economy, and then about sustainability, we come to a very important arena. That is the role of information and those agents who rally those information, that is the media. So today's topic is very relevant when we talk about generating awareness through credible media in the age of COVID. And in this time, there are some big, big words or some ideas that come into note. Number one, what about press freedom worldwide? What happens with fake news? When you have disruption happening all around you, you don't know who to trust. What happens to development programming? Who communicates these? And how are these you know, decisions taken by the individual and by the enterprise for home decision making, whether to go out or how to carry out your business or whether to purchase in any way whatsoever? These contemporary issues may also sidetrack other issues. And we also need to think about whether they've been pushed under the radar. And that's why today's topic becomes also very important. As such, we have some amazing panelists who are going to be talking about this from different angles. And they are all respected members in their fields, all connected to media in one way or the other, or they may give an exquisite angle on today's topic. And to talk about that, I'd like to call upon my co-moderator, Suhara Mehros. Suhara herself is accomplished as the research lead at UNDP Bangladesh, but also she's linked to this topic as she's one of the youngest people from Bangladesh and the, actually the first Bangladeshi to actually gain the Young Environmental Bangla uh, Asian Journalist Award of the Year. So without further ado, I'll let Suhara take it over for now. Suhara. Thank you so much, Maimoon, for the introduction. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. And thank you all to our fantastic panelists um, who have gracefully agreed to uh, join us and everyone who's watching. Um, and I think to add to what Maimoon said, I think this topic is very, very critical, um, which is like the, the process of awareness raising through credible media um, and communications, especially in this time of COVID, um, the crisis we are facing. And actually, um, on top of the pandemic, we are also kind of facing an infodemic with so much misinformation, so much information coming from every single direction. It's really hard sometimes to make that informed decision as to what is right and what is wrong and which points to pick up on. Um, and also there are so many different angles we need to, we hope to uncover to the discussions um, today, which include uh, whether the information is reaching all levels of society. Um, and given that the time sensitive nature of the data that we have to collect, whether that data is actually credible that we are collecting for our communications and programming, um, whether any issues actually are being sidelined as a result of all the focus we are giving on COVID reporting specifically. And also, more importantly, how uh, media coverage not just affects the general public, but also business decisions, which are so critical um, to driving the economy. So uh, these issues and more we hope to cover uh, with our uh, amazing list of panelists. I'll just give a very brief uh, introduction for each of them, because frankly, I don't think we can do them justice um, within the time we have. Um, but to, first, to, to start things off, we have uh, Mr. Zafar Subhan, who is the editor of the Dhaka Tribune, which is um, one of the leading um, national dailies uh, of Bangladesh. He was also selected as a young global leader by the, by the World Economic Forum and as a Yale World Fellow. Second, we have Mr. Nalaka Gunawardene, who has been a science writer with 30 years of experience and also a media analyst um, covering issues of social, cultural, and political impacts, specifically of information and communication technologies. Um, he has also been a communications consultant to various research organizations and development agencies um, and has 
written about issues which include the digital divide, um, social media proliferation, um, countering online disinformation, and safeguarding internet freedom. Um, and then we have Mr. Uh, Dr. Jagat Shah, who is the CMD of the Global Network um, India, which is an international trade advisory firm um, counseling SMEs, small and medium enterprises, artisans, and corporates to connect them to international markets. Um, he's also the founder and chief mentor of Vibrant Markets, which is a market research solutions provider. Um, in, in addition, he's also the um, foreign representative of the government of Manitoba, Canada in India for trade and investment. And uh, lastly, but not the least, we have Sarah Jane Saltmarsh, who is currently heading the program and enterprise communications in BRAC, which is the largest NGO, as we all know. Um, and in, in addition to that, um, she's also a global shaper or with the, with the uh, uh, which is an initiative of the World Economic Forum, a youth network. Um, and prior, previously, she has also um, worked with the Chief Minister's Department of the Northern Territory Government of Australia, as well as the International Labour Organization in Bangladesh. Um, so without further ado, I'm very glad that we have a very uh, multinational panel spanning like four countries. And now we also have Doug joining us. Um, so we'd like to get the conversation started and uh, a warm welcome to all of you and over to you, Doug. Very good, really appreciate it. Sorry for the technical problems. Uh, I think we've got a really great uh, program here teed up, uh, some uh, familiar faces and some new faces as well. I think we're gonna start uh, with uh, uh, Zafar Soban. Uh, would you please kick us off and we look forward to hearing more. Okay, my pleasure, Doug, and thank you as well, Sahara and Maimoun. Um, I want to start talking about the communication climate. I think in this unprecedented pandemic that we're all facing here in Bangladesh, communication is absolutely key here in the world. I mean, I think you have to go as far back as the Spanish flu pandemic of, the, of uh, 1917 to really have something comparable to this. And one of the things we're noticing here, I have a lot of people out on the ground, and um, I think this is something perhaps Sarah Jane can speak to more when she gives her presentation, because BRAC has done a lot of wonderful surveys as well, and we also work uh, closely with some, some of their institutes. Is there still a lot of confusion surrounding this crisis and what good policy is in um, how people should act. And I think, so for instance, when you have lockdown orders in Bangladesh, um, you have that uh, most people to this day, I think, have not really internalized why. They're doing it because they're being told to do it. I don't think they quite understand the reasons why. Now, where does the media come in in all of this? I think the media has an incredibly crucial role because at a time like this, the most important thing is... Um, communication, the most important thing is transparency and accountability. Now, I understand also that the government is very concerned, any government would be. This is a challenge, perhaps like none uh, they faced uh, before in the past. And as a result, they have a strong desire to control the narrative. But I think that would actually be counterproductive. And one of the things we've been seeing here in Bangladesh is in fact this strong desire to control the narrative. We've had since March 8th, which was when the first three cases of COVID-19 were detected in the country, we've had over a dozen journalists who've been arrested under the draconian um, Digital Security Act. And I feel that uh, things such as these are very counterproductive because what we really need is we need that free flow of information. And I think um, wherever this information comes from, it's useful to the individual and the average citizen. Now, certainly there are concerns about misinformation and disinformation. I do understand the government's um, hesitations about those, anxieties about those. We want to make sure people don't get uh, the wrong information. You certainly want to make sure that no panic is created, and you also want to make sure that, in fact, people who have an agenda to try and cause, uh, uh, you know, trouble either in the country for the government or for any other reason, don't really get the um, leeway to do so. Nevertheless, I think what you would find is that um, the mainstream media, certainly here in Bangladesh, has acted as far as, uh, in my assessment, very responsibly in how they have approached this crisis and in, in their reporting of the crisis, and I think 
they would be the best ally the government would have at a time like this you know we're all in this together no one you know no one gains if if uh, if this government any government doesn't get a handle on the situation and fails we all suffer so at this point in time everyone is in the same game and i think we should really use all of the sectors we have so we've got the private sector we've got the ngo sector we've got the government we've got the media all really need to be working hand in hand and i think the kind of the top down approach which we have perhaps seen in developing countries over the last uh, decade which has uh, gained more currency perhaps needs to be abandoned at this stage because i think what we really need to tackle this crisis is you know to throw things open to as many outside stakeholders as possible and i think you've seen the non-government sector and the media and the private sector all stepping up but i think one of the things is that even though they've been playing this role that uh, i think there's still a lot of hesitation among the government at least here in bangladesh of actually you know sitting uh, giving them sort of co-equal billing at the table and i think that's actually a mistake i think that were that freedom to be granted it would be it would be very helpful at a time like this um and you know i'll give you i, I mentioned a dozen journalists who have been you know um incarcerated for reporting on stuff such as the um, misappropriation of relief uh, uh, relief funds and food and stuff like this. And, you know, there are other issues which we've also raised in the media, which is very important. You know, we've, the media has been the one which is pushing the issues of how much we need to ramp up our testing. The media is the one which has been pushing the issue of how much uh, we need to really um, set up quarantine units. And I think that's still uh, something which, you know, the government is sort of coming around on. We've talked a lot about contact tracing and how that could be very helpful in addressing this issue. The truth of the matter is the more help you can get, and it's not just media here in Bangladesh. I mean, I think a lot of what we're learning is what we're learning from outside the country. We're seeing what has happened in places like Kerala. We're seeing what's happened in places like Sri Lanka. We're seeing what's happened in places like Vietnam, other countries with limited resources who've had a fair amount of success. So I feel that, um, that the role of the media here is absolutely crucial and, and, and it's important for the government to recognize that the media should be able to play this role and it's actually in their interest and in the interests of every uh, citizen of this country. And I think, you know, to some extent, in a, at a greater or lesser extent, you see this debate playing out in many other countries and perhaps more so um, in the developing world uh, where we generally have more uh, uh, governments you know, which uh, have more centralized control over both the economy and over communication and messaging. Um, but if we're talking about sort of disruption, what I would suggest is that we can use this crisis, this particular incident, which probably is gonna be with us for a long time to completely reimagine the rules of the game in terms of the relations between government in media and i think a lot of the distrust which uh, may have existed over the past decade there's just simply no time or space for that right now and certainly disinformation and misinformation is a, is a concern but i would argue and i've argued this before that the media mainstream media responsible media has as much of an interest in countering that as any government entity does so i think we're all on the same page here and i would just ask for you know that door to be opened in that partnership to be strengthened i think i'll leave it there for now i'm very interested to hear what our other panelists have to say and of course if there's any questions or clarifications anyone has uh, after this i'm more than happy to uh, take the mic again thank you thank you zahar could you just take a moment and explain why it's so important to be transparent what what's the why be transparent what's the value of well, I mean, I mean, the value of that is that it's very important to making the right decisions. OK, so basically the bottom line of this crisis and perhaps all crises, but certainly this one is data. How do you make the correct decision in terms of, OK, do we open up the lockdown or do we continue it? 
Okay, do we let garment manufacturers start to manufacture again, or do we lock them out for another week, another month? These decisions are made very clearly on data. It's very important to know what is the you know, percentage of people who are being tested who test positive. It's very important to know what the death rate is. It's very important to know what the infection rate is. If we don't have correct information, we're not going to make the right decision. And the making the right decision is absolutely crucial here. You know, it's always crucial in terms of government. This is literally life and death. Great points. Love it, because we're seeing that all over the world. Uh, Dr. Jagat Shah knows the value of data in a business. Um, and so, uh, Jagat, I think you rightly pointed out that this topic is a little bit different than you normally get involved with, but you are so involved on the business side of things, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Thanks, Doug. <clears throat> See, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I will present my perspective as a business person. I, I run six companies and I have people and <clears throat> so one of the business I do and I'll relate this COVID times and media with my business is <clears throat> we organize exhibitions like Vibrant Gujarat is a very popular one. And we do Vibrant Expos all over the country and uh, th thousands of people come and attend and we work all year to do it and this time it is not going to happen. So in October we were planning but it won't happen. So we are, we were, today is the 57th day of lockdown in my city in Ahmedabad in India. And we are at home and working from home, working more efficiently. And we have access to news. Uh, for at least 30, 40 days, newspapers were not allowed to be delivered at home because, uh, you know, the, a lot of people said that Corona sits in the newspaper also. So you, you can, if you touch, you are going to get it. So, uh, so social media, I mean, and then uh, digital uh, media was the platform. I'll give you two, three examples. So in business magazines and newspapers, and I was reading and social media also, exhibitions will not take place now. People will not go anywhere travel. Uh, people are not, uh, how, how Indian small medium enterprises will do their business globally because they used to take part in exhibitions and they used to sell, how they will sell now. Exhibitions used to take place in India and foreign companies used to come and buy, now they will not come. So industry is going to be in trouble. This is most news I saw. After 15, 20 days, I kept researching because I was trying to find an alternate and I found out that there are 16 companies in India who have launched virtual expo. In a virtual expo, 20 times more number of visitors can come and more business will happen. So I immediately converted my whole platform into a virtual platform. We tested one platform. What, what point I'm trying to say, nowhere in the media this came. I'm talking about a positive and a negative side as a business person, as a receiver of news. I kept receiving news that uh, exhibitions won't happen. So I am demoralized. I am feeling low. I do not know what's going to happen to my company. Should I sack my people? Should I tell them not to come to work because uh, exhibitions won't happen? So what you will do whole year? Or should I, and, and this perhaps media should have caught that what is alternate and what people are doing. That is also the need of the hour. And uh, through research when it started coming and it, it was me who actually started flowing this narrative in the country. And uh, today we have lined up six, seven virtual expos. And one we have already tested and we had 380 visitors for one day only and a lot of business also done. Second example I want to give is colleges, education system. So every day in newspaper, media, TV, everywhere it was coming, colleges are closed. Students are not going to study. There will be no exams. What is going to happen to their future? Where will they get jobs? Uh, final year exam will not happen. So, you know, very disturbing to me also. I run a digital institute also, training school also. We, for 21 years, we do training. So I said, oh, now nobody will come to do training because, you know, there, there is no classes happening. And at the same time, just before I am now, I am speaking with you. I just finished one big talk with 1,500 students of the largest technology university of India, which has got 60,000 students. And... The college, one college was telling me that last one month they conducted 1,140 online 
teaching sessions for the students. That is also reality. Now this news nobody is nowhere. And so I as a student or I as a company who runs an institute, I'm so afraid of what's happening. Nothing is going to happen. But the reality is, and I spoke to many of the students who are present in the talk and I was asking them questions. How was the quality? They said the quality of education we got online was five times better than classroom. So, so, you know, this is another aspect of news which should actually come and people should know about it. There will be a feeling of positivity. When I am in home for whole life, I was a social animal moving around the world and suddenly I am at home. I want good news to cheer me up. And this is also the reality, real side of it. I want to give another third, third example, oil. Uh, in the, I, I kept reading 48% oil consumption has gone down in India because of lockdown. So, okay, kept on happening 51%, 56%, 65% oil consumption. In just last four, five days of a little bit opening of Indian economy, oil consumption has now compared to same time last year, as of today is only 9% less. But there is no news about it. So the whole time it was going up, same power, power consumption, 48, 50% was reducing. And now it is hardly minus 6% compared to similar time last year. If I'm running a factory, if I see that, oh, 55% power consumption was low, was down earlier and now only minus 6%, I am getting a very positive signal to start my factory and to bring back my people, employ them. I have the courage to, you know, go and start doing because others are doing, you know. I would like to conclude by giving a very interesting real-time example of a friend of mine who is, who, who is from Kerala state in South India. He was in UK for 20 years. And then he said, I'm bored of this life and you know, I want to come back to my hometown and start something. And then he started a newspaper. It's called Future Kerala. What an amazing idea. Most uh, those of you who are in media will know that it is very difficult to make money in newspapers. Okay. Uh, it's a loss making business. That's what he, I hear in India. He turned around his company in eight months. He is making profit. What is the only one USP? Only one differentiator is that. He told me that there are thousands and thousands of newspapers in India. What is my space going to be? He did only one small thing. He has got right now 16 page uh, tabloid. Uh, and he started putting on the top of the newspaper a red mark and saying negative news and a green mark saying positive news and started giving percentage. That in today's my newspaper, so much percentage of news is negative, so much is positive. And he said every, like a vegetarian and non-vegetarian sign in every news, he started putting a dot, green and red. He said, I am giving a choice to the, to the reader to read what they want to read. I'm not forcing them to read everything and then see that, oh, wow, majority of it is negative. So I think this sensationalism is also attached to negativity. So more negative news, there is more sensation. I think this needs all, and he is he, doing amazing. One day he was telling me, Jagat, uh, two days back, I did an experiment. He said, most of my news used to be positive. Okay, percentage would be 72% positive, 78% positive. He said, one day I deliberately 18% positive. And he said, I did 82% negative. He said, I got hundreds and hundreds of phone calls and emails. Why? Why? Why you have so many negative news? today? He said, I just wanted to test the people. So a lot of times media says that people are interested in negative news. People are interested in sensationalism, which is not true. In this case, I found out. Right. So anyway, so these are just some anecdotes of my real life. I wanted to share. And as a business person, I think it is a, it is a, moral and responsible duty of media to present both sides. Yes, truth is bitter and truth should always come. See, I have always in my so many uh, talks, I always say the four pillars of democracy is your legislature, judiciary, bureaucracy and media. Without these pillars, I mean, media is a pillar of democracy. A democracy will strive and survive only on these pillars. That is agreed, but then that has to be some kind of this balance also which needs to be 
drawn. And as a business people, when I see positive news, it is going to help so many people whom I am employing, plus a whole vendor network with whom I work, my customers, the entire ecosystem. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Thank you for both the positive and the enlightening information. Uh, several, several thoughts bubble up into my mind. For those of you out there, please send your questions in uh, wherever you are. Uh, you can send it to info at globalchamber.org. You can send it into the system, and uh, we'll be able to have some time at the end to, to get to some of those at least. Our next speaker, Nalaka, has got a lot of experience in Sri Lanka, and I'm wondering your extended background and what you're seeing there. You know, what are some of the things that are resonating here? And please do share your thoughts as well. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I, I hope uh, uh, our friends in Bangladesh are safe from the super cyclone Amphan uh, as it's headed away from us in Sri Lanka towards you and Eastern India. Uh, it, it is a, a different kind of disaster that, that this pandemic has turned out to be. It's fundamentally different uh, to the kind of hydrometeorological disasters and tsunamis that we typically grapple with. Uh, as as uh, citizens and as as uh, media, so I'm talking today as a as a former journalist who has moved on from the newsroom, but who remains very much engaged with media as a columnist, as a media researcher, and then also a media teacher. Uh, I see COVID nineteen uh, as a slowly unfolding disaster caused by this invisible virus. We don't know the end in sight. And besides the health impact, we've seen the enormous uh, social and economic impacts here in Sri Lanka. We ended a 52-day lockdown on the 11th of May. We are slowly relaxing and trying to resume normal activity, but with uh, uh, many precautions. And that is still very much a challenge. Uh, I want to make two points uh, this evening, basically. The first one is that, uh, Physical globalization enabled the rapid spread of this virus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. And some say that this, in addition to other considerations, uh, should now let us lead us to uh, a real debate about the merits and demerits of globalization. I wouldn't go into that here, but. What I'm saying is, it is information globalization that has been helping humanity to cope with the many impacts of COVID. Uh, and as we know, as societies went into lockdowns, the internet users shot up. Also, uh, not just the internet, the use of all media and communication services has been going up and, and has remained high. Uh, and in Sri Lanka, uh, where around 40% of the population is online, it's actually from television and radio that most of our people get their news and current affairs information. And viewing and audience uh, rates have been higher than at most times in recent memory. And again, with 150 active mobile subscriptions per 100 persons in our country, uh, we've seen uh, an extra dose of mobile phone use for voice, for text, and for data. So what does all this, what does all this mean? I think uh, we would have found it very hard to endure lockdowns if there was not that support of information services from the legacy media or mainstream media on the one hand and from the online content on the other. So what happens uh, when all this is over? We don't know how soon that's going to be uh, over. So I wouldn't talk about post COVID, but uh, I think we have probably crossed some thresholds from which there is no turning back. The demise of printed editions of newspapers may have been accelerated by the recent experience. And more and more news is being consumed online and newspapers are more and more investing in digital platforms. The wider adoption of e-commerce now looks inevitable. 
there was some regulatory uh, hesitation and there was also consumer trust issues. But recent weeks, we've seen that, that it's a viable option. It works with still various imperfections. Same with mobile money. Regulators may drop their earlier resistance to mobile money because of the recent experience and the, the challenges posed by COVID. There is danger, of course, that the digital hype may mesmerize our policymakers into making choices that leave behind sections of society. And that is what we have to guard against. That is where we need to uh, stay focused. That's my first point. The second point is that I consider information as fuel for knowledge societies. But that fuel, that information can get contaminated by lies, by fabrications, and by manipulation of the information. In other words, researchers call it the information disorder. In popular terms, we call it uh, fake news or disinformation and misinformation. And WHO has been calling it the infodemic, uh, which WHO says is hampering many public health interventions uh, that governments are taking to contain the pandemic. Fake news has always been around. I mean, it's been around for centuries, but what's new is that uh, the digital and online tools have enabled it to spread much further and much faster. And therein lies the challenge. And in the current pandemic, uh, the problem is aggravated by the gaps in scientific knowledge about this new virus and the disease it causes. Because Six months ago, nobody knew about this. And in the, in the last few months, medical researchers have been uncovering a lot about COVID, but there is still a lot that they admit they don't know. And new knowledge keeps emerging and some of the early assumptions have to be revised. So that and the fact that uh, there is incomplete and evolving knowledge makes it harder to communicate public health messages without triggering either panic or complacency. So how do communicators, including journalists, but also public health communicators, how do they get that messaging right? That is a challenge. And into that uncertainty and, and variability, uh, to make matters worse, comes disinformation, deliberately spread falsehoods, as well as misinformation, which is when people share it without realizing it is false. Uh, there is another challenge. We journalists know that separating the truth from rumor or truth from falsehood is never easy, even at the best of times. Who is the arbiter of truth on a given matter? Is it elected representatives in government? Is it unelected uh, public officials? Is it the military top brass or the top ranked clergy? Or in this case, is it the medical researchers and public health specialists who has the ultimate, ultimate interpretation or version of the truth? Who certifies it? Now, this is what newsrooms face every day when, in fact, uh, there are different opinions on certain aspects of the COVID response. What can journalists make of it? And what can their audiences make of it? This is, this is part of the problem. When everyone is still in the learning curve, honest mistakes can happen even by the most experienced journalists. And, and also, deliberate falsehood can come into it and separating it, fact from the fiction and from the half-truths then becomes a lot harder for the average citizen, the average media consumer. Now, to make the best possible sense of the imperfect knowledge that I referred to, uh, societies need, I would argue, three, three things, three elements. One, professional journalists in whatever medium, whatever platform they operate. Two, vigilant fact checkers. Fact checkers to hold the media to account, fact checkers to also hold the officials and politicians to account. Thirdly, we need diligent citizens 
with enough literacy, enough media literacy, and enough digital literacy, so that they cannot be fooled easily by what comes their way. I think uh, societies now have more reasons than ever before to value and support these three elements. Support good journalism, support fact-checking services and fact-checkers, as well as support initiatives for enhancing media and digital literacy, formal as well as informal. Uh, whoever is engaged in that, they deserve our support. And I would like to end by saying that uh, media is a plural. There is many kinds of media today. And what matters is the acts of journalism, whether it is in the legacy media, whether it is in digital platforms or even citizens bearing witness, analyzing information. For example, we've seen in this crisis, data scientists, and we've seen uh, medical doctors performing acts of journalism in the public interest, bringing their specialized skills and knowledge into discussions and engaging with journalists and citizens. And that's, that's necessary, that's to be applauded. So we must cheer all acts of journalism wherever it comes from. And institutional media, we must hold it to account. Thank you. Outstanding information, really thought provoking. Thank you very much. Uh, our last speaker is Sarah Jane Saltmarsh. She's got her experience on uh, almost every continent. So uh, Sarah Jane, we look forward to hearing your thoughts as well. Thank you. I think what, I'm, uh, what I'll talk about has, you know, a fair bit of linkage to what Zafar Bai was speaking about as well as the previous speaker. Um, I think BRAC sits in a unique position in that we're an organization which provides health services um, to millions of people across Bangladesh. But at the same time, you know, we're running a university which is doing research. We're also, you know, we've got, um, we've had people going out spreading communications to 40, almost 45 million people in Bangladesh. Um, so we have such a wide range of services. So we've seen this pandemic and this infodemic from, you know, a wide range of angles. I think um, to address the, the kind of point that the, the previous speaker made about, um, you know, how can we make sure that we're doing effective messaging? There's a couple of things that I'd share that, that you know, come from my experience on the ground um, during COVID-19. The first one is that it's so important to have this um, contextuality. So, so important to be in touch on the ground. We've got one of the things that we put in really early in BRAC was making sure that every single day we've got a, you know, map in the office and we point out um, that we, we make sure that each of our staff speak to, not every single one of our staff, BRAC has 100 million staff. So the staff in the communications department that we're speaking to people in every one of the 64 districts of Bangladesh. So we're collecting, you know, rumors and um, all of these myths and we're, you know, bringing them back and we're asking the way that the staff do it is that they have a minimum 15 minute conversation. So you spend the first five minutes talking to the person and asking about the family and, you know, the health and all of that stuff. So you establish that rapport and then you start asking them about, you know, what's BRAC doing in terms of services, what could be done better. Um, and all of that information is feeding back into our, into our data system. Um, the, we found this to be particularly important because so much of the communication, so much of the, the communication and the terms we were getting had to be indigenized. So I think Zafra pointed this out. Um, you know, you have things like, for example, a lot of the messaging was around, initially was around hand washing. And, you know, in Bangladesh, you have 14% of people that have access to running water. Um, so what, for all of the rest of the people, what does, what do those messages mean? You also have things like, for example, the meaning of a house. So the there's plenty of words for house in, in Bangla and they're very different. Whereas if you're in a refugee camp, if you're in a slum, if you're in a rural village. Um, so a lot of those terms had to be broken down and indigenized. I think the second point um, would be making sure that um, you really do your audience segmentation. So we, um, we really broke down a lot of our communicate. We broke down all of our communications to a specific set of audiences, and, so, and we thought about things like trust. So you know, while we put out a lot of information across you know, social media, often that's and a lot of people see it. Reach is not the same as people um, connecting with and understanding it. So we we've had our community health workers out um, in 
all districts of Bangladesh. And they're, thing, they're people that they're from that community, so people know them and they, um, they trust them. So we put a lot more effort into that um, field force than we would normally. Um, and we thought a lot about things like access, so making sure that as we were doing our segmentation, we were making sure that we had, we were covering different dialects, made sure we were covering people with disabilities, um, transgenders, all of these, um, you know, groups that might otherwise be forgotten and in reality they are you know you see whether it's relief or whether it's communication it's the strongest people at the front and then there are a lot of people women-headed households groups like that that are at the back um, we also looked into you know who people run into by default so pharmacists for example turned out to be a really key audience for us so you know not necessarily you would always go to a pharmacist sometimes you would for health advice but in in COVID-19 when you when most of the health services are severely overburdened people are you know turning to the nearest health professional and that happens to be a pharmacist so equipping them with good information and, and collecting rumors from them um, you know, it was really important because people are in crisis mode. They're paying a lot more attention and giving a lot more emphasis on what their, their neighborhood pharmacist would say than usual. Um, I think the third point would be making sure that, you know, content is, is simple, it's relatable and it's, um, you know, and it shows empathy. I think we've, we've all seen some great examples um, from Jacinda Ardern in, in New Zealand in terms of, you know, that really showing empathy um, in her communication and, you know, so I think we've really tried to not only give instructive information, telling people where to go and what to do, but also um, making them, telling them why and informing them so that they feel like they're empowered, which also helps with the fear and also making them feel like they're part of the solution. So, um, and I think, you know, while I, I work in Bangladesh, I'm currently in Australia and, you know, we've also seen examples there where people have, I mean, taking it upon themselves so much to the point that they'll, you know, dob other people in for not doing social distancing, et cetera. So yeah, it's about also keeping it hopeful. So, you know, simple, relatable, showing empathy and, um, you know, making people feel like they're part of the solution. Um, and being careful of, you know, um, creating and fueling your own myths and stigmas along the way as well. We've been very careful to make sure that our content wasn't, um, misconstrued and therefore actually created new myths and we've had a few examples where that's happened we've managed to nip it in the bud quite quickly um, one of the 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 last kind of examples that i would give was that um you know we've we we've really looked at you know a lot of challenges and you know tried to make them into opportunities for example in bangladesh we have a huge you know like like many countries we have a huge harvesting season and um so you know we're quite worried when it comes to harvesting season not only were there you know many issues in terms of you know labor movements being restricted etc but we're also just um worried because there's a whole lot of people close to each other working and there's a you know a movement of people coming in to work in those spaces and so just a chance for um for there to be a lot of transmission so you know we went there and and i think there were some key things you know worked quite well i think we got um we got a local um you know agriculture personality um to do miking and in in all of the areas we also made sure that not only were we telling people about social distancing and hand washing and stuff but we you know installed um hundreds of hand washing stations as well so that they could act on the information that they were giving so I think the, the key from that was um, understanding people's pain. You know, you can't, you have to understand what situation they're actually in and what they're facing and then say, hey, I can't just give, you know, wax lyrical about what you should be doing, but I've also got to provide a way for you to be able to actually do it. Um, yeah, and, you know, I think in that case, it was kind of like a bit of a nudge, um, bit of a nudge tactic that we did by, um, yeah, saying this is what you should do. And uh, by the way, let's make it really easy for you to do it. Um, yeah, and I think maybe just the last kind of thing that we've seen um, more recently has been, um, I mean, we've been seeing this for a while, but we've started to really do something about it was that we've, we've noticed, and this happened, this is consistent with our previous experience in, um, in Africa during Ebola, that people were really scared to self-report and, you know, it was causing huge problems because of course it um, encourages transmission to healthcare workers. So we were, um, you know, really concerned about how to fix that. What we've, what we've been doing is we've been making sure that people have the right information. So, you know, people are not, when they're, they're not leaving in ambulances like they normally would, they're, they're leaving in 
you know, police vans or army vans when they're being picked up um, to go to health services now. And for a family member, all they're seeing is their loved ones disappearing in some, you know, um, you know, an army or a um, police van, and then they might not see them again. So they have no idea. So we've, we've put a lot of effort into mapping out that patient journey and also into sharing stories of people um, that have survived and how it's been and really trying to make that all that information really transparent for people so we can break down some of that fear, which, which we've, we've seen in Bangladesh and we also saw in Ebola can be just as dangerous as the, as the virus when you have families, you know, ditching family members in forests. And, you know, we've seen a few examples of that already. And in general, just people having a, um, uh, being really mentally affected by it. So we're trying to break that down. And then the next step that, you know, we're discussing with people now is, you know, like, um, you know, when, when, you know, the cyclone is finished and when Eid is finished, we're looking at what the next stage will be and what we're contemplating is going to a really um, granular level and um, taking an approach like BRAF has done previously in Bangladesh with the oral rehydration solution, going house to house, making sure that in every single house you have one person who is going to be your champion, who is fully understanding about, you know, everything to do with, the, um, with the virus and they're going to be the ones who are going to make sure it happens within their house. So we're contemplating going to that really granular level with our communication versus the mass kind of approach that we've done now. Wonderful. Thank you. Great information. I'm going to turn it over back to Sohara and Maimun and we'll go back and forth between the three of us. I have a lot of questions in my own mind. I see there's questions coming in along the way as well. So keep those coming. If we don't get to them, we'll be able to uh, hopefully answer them even after the session. So Hara and Maimun, uh, what are some of the questions that, that you have and that you're seeing? Thanks. Um, thanks, Doug. And thank you so much, panelists. That was really insightful, I think, for us also, everyone who's, who's listening. I think one of the questions um, that came up um, that I think would be good to address is from Mr. Uh, Ranjit Chakraborty, uh, who's from uh, UNDP. Um, and I think he specifically uh, gives this question to Mr. Nalaka Gunawardene, um, which is about, you know, the average citizens kind of panicking, um, you know, when they get any information and probably they might not have the capacity to be able to make that analysis of whether or not uh, that piece of information is credible um, and differentiate between uh, rumor and truth. So what role can sort of journalists play in dispelling the panic and confusion among the layman, essentially, is the question. OK. Uh, the way I see it, journalists are trained to be, to be information filters. They critically examine every piece of information, or at least they should. And they, they have the, the analytical skills. They have the license to question, to demand explanation from government and from experts. So in a way, journalists are in a privileged position to, to actually critically examine and demystify once they have clarified the information. So first they have to verify and get, get their facts and analysis right. And then they have to communicate in a way that uh, the, the non-specialist, the average person is able to understand. And without triggering either panic or equally bad is complacency in times like this. So uh, to get the levels right, accuracy, balance, and, and also sometimes the, the style, the, the intensity of the message, the timing of it, all that matters. But what I'm seeing more and more is that as people get their information directly online, they don't have that filtering and the, the careful curation that journalists do, though journalists have historically been doing. So that's why it's also important to build digital literacy skills in everyone who goes online, that they don't believe uncritically what comes their way through WhatsApp or Facebook or other channels, other media. And that's both, both are needed. We need the professional journalists as well as we need the digital literacy to be enhanced uh, in all of us.
Uh, Maimon, your mic is turned off. Can you please uh, turn it on? Hi, sorry about that, everyone. So um, this is a question directed at Dr. Jagat from Mr. Rasan Rahman from Dhaka. So this is, uh, I guess, applies to not only Bangladesh, she talked about Bangladesh over here, that how are countries which are dependent highly on export and import going to recover from this global pandemic? Uh, you see, uh, what I'm propagating in India is that, you know, we have this, uh, we are seeing next three months uh, for any business within India or exports to be very difficult time. But next nine months, I, my uh, thinking is that uh, we, every company who was exporting earlier will be able to do more exports than entire last year in nine months. So the three months which are uh, a difficult period uh, to things to come back is the period when these companies should actually uh, innovate their business models and uh, look at new approaches, new markets perhaps. Uh, we, are, we have actually started doing analysis that uh, which are the countries in the world which are not impacted or very least impacted by uh, Corona. And is there a possibility of a market being there? You know, so that three month period can be used to uh, look at those. So in a, by default, it will become a, a diversification of markets. And uh, with some of the companies, we are succeeding at least in getting inquiries, which used to never happen before. So this is my model. I call it 3M. So three months is a challenge. 9M is nine months is going to do more business than last year. If they use this interim period of lockdown as well as three months to gain knowledge and use digital technologies. I am saying everybody that you don't have to travel to go and meet people uh, like we do generally in international business. We don't have to go to exhibitions now. Everybody has been doing this type of meetings. Everybody, even small medium companies are doing this type of meetings. Uh, so we have learned the digital way of, uh, doing, uh, of doing business. So use that for three months and build your network. You, you will do actually more business. My belief is countries like Bangladesh, particularly Bangladesh. I have, uh, I have been visiting Bangladesh since 1999, more than 30 times, I think. And the, the business community there, particularly the export community is going to have amazing opportunity. But next three months is challenge, is, is difficult. And that three months is the time for preparation and to change the way we have been doing business till now. And that change, uh, I, I often, with Doug knows, I often in Global Chamber program keep telling that the only permanent constant now is change. So either we can be a agent of change or a victim of change. So every exporting company which will not do well, I call them victim of change. Great. Uh, thank you, sir. I think we have another uh, question, which I think Zafar Bhai might be most suited to answer. Um, it's from Vishal Dahal, who's in Nepal. And while his question is specific to Nepal, I think he, he wants insights from any other country. So the question is, lots of industries in Nepal try to get updated information uh, regarding the plans and programs by the government during lockdown. Um, and what happens is their Ministry of Home Affairs issues notice and circulars for the information but some circulars are not clear in terms of what the message is. So media houses and journalists have a really challenging time trying to disseminate this information and interpret and share that with the public. So, um, so it, what essentially they end up doing is they try to register an application with the ministry um, using the Right to Information Act, um, but often the ministry is not responsive um, to, to those actions um, since trade unions are involved um, and votes are involved, et cetera. So his, his question essentially is, if uh, any panel member could share if such situation also persists in any of these countries and what can be some uh, provisions or actions that can be taken to make sure you know we can overcome these difficulties. I mean, I think uh, if I could uh, uh, take, a, take a stab at this one, I think it is something which exists all over South Asia simply because this kind of confidentiality and secrecy at the high levels of government is very deeply ingrained in our culture. And certainly the government in Bangladesh, I think, is no different from any other government in South Asia, where they generally err on the side of controlling information. And in a time like this, it's also very understandable because we also understand what the um, risks are. We understand what the stakes are. But I think it's a wrong-headed way to go, as I had mentioned earlier. And one of the things which is important is um, I would just like to 
refer to a survey which the University of Liberal Arts Bangladesh and Dhaka Tribune did. It was a major research project um, which we finally presented last year, um, last month. And it took six months about trust in the media and it found that 63% of the public actually has a high degree of trust in the news media. And so I think if the government is, needs to get its messaging out there, they need to understand that they need to actually take the media as, a, as an ally rather than as a threat. Now, how do we communicate this to the government? I think, you know, at this time, you know, sort of going through courts, filing Right to Information Act um, petitions, I don't see that that's really going to be the way to do it. I think the way to do it is, again, partnerships. And I'm seeing a greater... Um, appetite, certainly in Bangladesh, among the, uh, the government. I think initially when this crisis hit, they were, you know, scrambling. But now I think they see the benefit of reaching out to, across the aisle to the NGO community, to the media, to the private sector. And I think they need to understand, and I think they are understanding, that if we're going to actually come through on the other side in one piece, that all of these engines of an economy, of a country, need to be firing on all cylinders altogether. That's it. All right, I think uh, we'll have scope for one more question. Uh, we want to end at nine today. I'll, I'll throw this uh, personal one from, for uh, Sarah Jane. We've seen the model that BRAC has used to be, uh, you know, bearers of good information and communication. Could this somehow uh, be utilized in larger way or in a more uh, expansive way that we can reach out to communities uh, to be the bearer of, of good information uh, in regards to media? We already see that traditional newspapers don't reach people. What happened in this regard, Sarah? If you could enlighten us. Absolutely. I mean, I think that um, this, one of the interesting things is, um, you know, in the same tune as what Zafabai was saying, it definitely does take all of us to be able to tackle something like this. And also same as what Jagat was saying, you, what we've seen is some really unprecedented um, cooperation, you know, so we've, so NGOs, I wouldn't say traditionally always work together, um, but we've seen some great cooperation in this time. We've also seen really strong collaboration with the government and with media houses. I don't think it's possible that we could have gotten any stronger support from media when, as soon as there's a, there's information that wants to go out. I remember, I remember when, so when we decided that we would start doing messaging through, um, uh, our initial messaging through um, Kudus Boyati is one of the, you know, folk, a pretty famous folk performer in Bangladesh. We had every news media channel immediately sharing everything. So we're seeing a really high degree of um, cooperation and um, working together that I hope is going to be a precedent going forward. Um, I think definitely, I mean, as, as BRAC continues and, you know, as we work at this, you know, move into this kind of more even more community level i think we'll definitely one of the messages we'll definitely be sharing is um that you know is that people need to you know really you know i think helping people to to discern what is good um what is good information and what isn't helping them to do their own filtering and of course encouraging them to you know to um subscribe to good media and pay attention to information and absolutely i think that we all have a role to play in sharing a bit more hope um particularly when we're seeing cases rise and we're seeing more uncertainty and all of these lockdowns are just you know we're, we're into like two months of them so we all have a role to play in um sharing a few more positive stories to, at least if it's all to preserve our mental health Brilliant. Sounds so good. Um, I'll just uh, say uh, a very, very big thank you to Dr. Jagat Shah, uh, Nalaka Gunawardene, Zafar Sufan, and of course, Sarah Jane, to uh, participate with us today and give us these amazing insights. Uh, to all the participants, if you do have any further questions, uh, please email us. Uh, we have also been on Facebook Live, so this video will be there uh, in www.facebook.com slash let's disrupt. You can give questions in the comments and we'll try to uh, get the panelists to answer your questions. We are right here at nine. So goodbye from MCFG, from uh, Global Chamber Barisal, as well as the UNDP in Bangladesh. I'll hand it over to Doug and we'll take one last picture because we didn't have him in the first one and we all want to be smiling. Thank you all for your input, Doug.
<laughs> Thank you so much, my bun. Um, I, I'd also like to uh, have Sohara, if you could just say a, a few closing words as well. No, thank you, Doug. And I think, uh, thank you so much all the panelists. It is one of the reasons UNDP wanted to uh, partner with this initiative is we are trying to make interventions that are really well informed. Um, and I think the insights you have shared would really help us design our communication strategies to really make sure in the words of uh, Mr. Kunawardene that we're not leaving anyone behind. We're really including everyone um, and helping people make informed decisions in, in, in recovering from this pandemic. So thank you all for your insights. Thank, thank you, Sohara. Thank you, everybody. I mean, I think the one thing that keeps coming back to me as we, as Global Chamber grows around the world is that we, we all face so many of the same issues. And the issues that were talked about today that might have been focused in around Bangladesh are issues that every citizen in the world experiences. And we're all experiencing, obviously, COVID-19 as well. And so, in some ways, the, the hope of this pandemic is that the understanding that we are so connected, that we are so much alike, is one of the, the hopeful parts of the, the tragedies. And so let's, let's keep moving forward. And as the global tribe knows, let's uh, be global and unstoppable. Thanks for participating in today's Global Chamber event and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. See you next time.